Los Angeles from the early 20th century all the way till today is a city defined by immigrants arriving here in wave after wave. We're a city of immigrants. You know, it's all coming in a human migration, a human journey ultimately. That's how food gets around the world. We carry it with us in our stomachs, in our bodies, and uh, in our culture. Those kinds of journeys, those kinds of migrations are very Los Angelino. So stuff starts to shift culturally in all kinds of different ways. Uh, people start learning the language, but it's not just the immigrants that are changed. The immigrants are changing the natives. And you can literally track a people's history and the history of a city and the culture they're bringing from the old country, how it's transformed here, and how it transforms the whole. And you know, that's how great cities are made. I came here to the United States when I was 20 years old. Actually, it was my birthday when I came here. Uh, my mom and uh, my brothers were home. They went to pick me up by um, it was a McDonald's, I believe. And for the first time in life, uh, I saw my mom, I hugged my mom. I kissed my mom, and finally I met my brothers. I felt like it was like a reunion. We live in a foodie culture, and I wish that we could see beyond the food sometimes to the hands that make the food. To get to the story of the guy who's bussing the tables or who's doing the food prep. the politics of, of migration, the, the labor economy, all that drama plays out in the restaurants that we go to, that get Zagat raided and that are all the rage one day. And when we walk into those places, we're actually on such intimate terms with these migration stories. We're eating food that's been touched by hands that in turn have been molded by war, and uh, political upheaval and famine. Well, I mean, when I hired George, uh, he was a dishwasher. June 17th of 2016, it'll be 11 years that we've been open, and Jorge has been here that whole time. It was like a body of emotions, but at the same time, I left my dad back in Guatemala. So I didn't know if cry, uh, laugh, feel happy, feel sad many things, but it was a new life. It was something different. He does everything. He's always one of the first ones here. He receives all of our produce. He oversees the guys when they come in in the morning. The prep list that we prepare on a nightly basis probably has over 100 different things listed. That's a big job. <laughs> it's a big job. When he's not here, it takes two people to do it. To shuck an oyster, it requires you to be a little gentle on the little guy, regardless of how big or small it is. Because if you go in there like Rambo, you're gonna completely tear it up. And you're gonna, it's gonna look, the presentation will be awful. Rigo's a great kid. And the fact that he's George's brother, the fact that they came from the same womb just blows me away because they couldn't be more polar opposites. You know, I mean, I think largely it has to do with the fact that Rigo was brought up here and George was brought up back home. The first time I, I stepped into the kitchen, I didn't know what I was really getting into. 
I thought that it was just gonna be simple little things, simple recipes, but then you're issued an a apron, a, a cook hat, and a chef coat, and then they go, all right, here's this recipe, now do it. So George had to go ahead and hold my hand and, tell, and guide me through, this is how you slice a carrot. This is how you clean a leek. And it takes time, and even to this day, I'm still learning a lot more things. Behind every kitchen in Los Angeles, I don't care if it's a sushi restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, a fine dining establishment, there is a Mexican or a Central American in the kitchen. And it's not just the dishwashers. And a lot of people say, well, you know, it's because of cheap labor. Well, they're willing to do it. It's, and really, that's not what it is. It's actually people that are very skilled at doing this. You need a professional. The ways of migration that arrived here correspond to historical moments of great upheaval. It's food that comes out of human history, particularly from the East, from Asia, and from the South, from Latin America. It's productive in terms of the economy, and it's also creative because they're trying to uh, do good business, and to do good business to get customers, <laughs> you have to be creative. What are you gonna do to get customers in? Something different. And oftentimes, uh, of course, that happens on, on the level of, of culture itself. So you get a thriving you know, business community in these immigrant places because people are just striving so hard to establish themselves and, uh, and survive. My mom started the restaurant in 1994. It's all her recipe. The idea came from how we ate at home because everybody's busy. It's really hard to fix themselves with a meal like that because, you know, wives and husbands, they're all working. Well, most of the people, they think of as um, Korean barbecue is Korean food. Of course, that's Korean food, but behind that, there is so much more and so, it's just so much more that's out there to try. And people are actually noticing it now. Our main signature dish was black cod, we call it here, and the proper name is called sable fish. In Hawaii, they also call it butterfish. And that became the one that people come for. We, we cut a steak cut and sits on top of the daikon radish, and it's set with the fish and marination. And it, it just gets braised, and the, the radish itself is really hard. But because it's been set, cooked, it gets softened, and it gets all the ju juice and the flavor soaks in. So it's actually really good. Hango
안녕하세요. 네, 안녕하세요. 예, 네, 안녕하세요. 어, 그리고 저뭐좀더 가질 게 있는데 저 아실로 갈게요. 성격이 아주 발란했죠. 성격이 발란하고 또 제가 그 친구들이 많이 따랐어요. 친구들이 우리 집에 대문 앞에서 아무튼 줄을 지어서 썼어요. 그렇게 친구들이 좋아했었어. 사람 택해를 하는 걸 보니까 나보다는 더 낫겠다. When I first got into cooking, my parents were like, why would you do that? But it was just their insecurity because they have no knowledge of the industry. When I came here, I did what any immigrant would do, like what anything you would see in the movies, like this guy walking down the street, passing his resumes to every restaurant he goes to, hawking Craigslist for 12 hours, 13 hours a day, sending out resumes. And mind you, my resume was just college degree, culinary degree, but from the Philippines. Zero experience. It's been hard. And a lot of people don't realize how, how hard it is to get here. Because oftentimes they just see the, the end. It's not even the end yet. I'm just in the middle of my journey. So I've worked at the French Laundry, Guy Savoy, the Ritz-Carlton, and Patina. And right after Patina, I opened Rice Bar. And people were surprised, like, why would you open such a little restaurant in the middle of downtown? I've lived in downtown for six years, and it was always hard to find a place where it's comforting, where it's like, it's real, it's, it's not a concept, that it's heartfelt. Like, every time I come home to the Philippines, my mom would always ask me, like, what do you want to eat when you arrive? And what do you want to eat when you leave? It's always these dishes that I, Instantly, I'm able to blurt out. I was like, why don't I make that food here and do it properly and use my knowledge of cuisine and, and turn that into a restaurant? To me, the, the story that I see across so many different communities is just how hard people hustle to be able to kind of make the food, to figure out how to distribute it, how to bring in customers to the restaurants. Alvin Kailan first really blew up off the strength of a, a food truck called Exlet, which would serve egg sandwiches. Based on the success of that, he was invited to open up a stand in Grand Central Market, which has become phenomenally successful. I think you have to wait about an hour during the lunch rush in order to get in there. When we first started Exit, it was like, I'm going to do it for six months. That's all I had the money for. And, you know, it was a struggle until we finally got a write up from uh, Ruth Reichel who was like the editor-in-chief of Gourmet Magazine and like food critic of New York Times in the 80s. And she was known for shutting down restaurants by her, like, by her words. And she stumbled upon our food truck on Fairfax and she loved it. And she blogged about it. And once someone like that blogs about it, all the other blogs want to try it. So it spread like wildfire. We had this weird 
phenomenon of a brunch situation going on where it's like someone would pull up in a Ferrari, grab food from a food truck, and then eat it on the curb. Grand Central Market opened in 1917, and at the time, it was a very diverse place, as it is now, throughout the 70s. It's so a lot of people were fleeing countries and coming here to benefit from better working conditions, being able to send money home. And the market ended up being um, a center for that community to purchase goods because they couldn't find them anywhere else. And it also had the flavor at that point of a market that was back in their own country. The place really began with a lot of immigrants who ran the original stalls. Sometimes whole families are working here and it starts you know, with the parents, the children grow up here, they take over, they change it a little, update it. It's just, it, it's fascinating to see how it all evolves and, uh, and it's exciting process. My grandfather, Celestino, he ran a stand at a market similar to the Grand Central Market in Mexico. And he wanted to come to Los Angeles to run his own stand. He started working at A&B Coffee, which is now Chile Secos. And he's the one that introduced all the Hispanic products. Los productos que encontró fueron los chiles secos, los frijoles, lentejas, semilla de calabaza, mmm, frascos de, de todas clases de especies. El negocio lo era todo para él, en el aspecto de, de todo lo que luchaba, porque del negocio salía para uno. Pudo comprar el negocio porque pidió un pequeño préstamo y luego la casa la refinanció tres veces. Cuando ya supimos que lo compró, muy contento. Muy contento como si un juguete de un niño. Era lo que él quería. Dice, ya tengo lo que quería, lo que tanto tiempo soñé. Estuviera malo o no estuviera, él estaba allí. A veces tenía calentura un día en la noche y, y otro día, no vayas. Él iba. Él iba. In 2013, I had jury duty and I was excited because I got to go to Grand Central Market for lunch. So I thought I would go and visit my aunt who at this point had taken over. Also around this time, it's when egg slut came up and the market was changing and I saw all these changes and I hadn't been to the market in a few years. So going and seeing all the changes and seeing our stand, I decided that I had to go back and, and move forward with our business and keep us relevant and keep my grandfather's legacy alive. When I was a child, I would always go to my grandmother's house, Mahin, and she would make me breakfast lohme. Lohme is a Farsi word which means to savor in one bite. Taking a little bit of everything that you have in front of you and creating the perfect bite. It's, you know, usually eaten with your hands, not utensils. She would get a whole chicken from the butcher shop in Iran. She would butcher the chicken at home. She would cut the liver and the heart. She would saute that in the chicken fat, season it, and then crack two whole eggs. And that was their breakfast. Eating that type of food for me really 
grew my palate to a different consciousness, I would say. It exposed me to offal and uh, sucking the marrow out of the bones and not being afraid to eat with my hands. Is when I go out to dinner with my friends, I have to hold myself back because I'm like, but it just feels natural. I, I want to use my hands. I think there's something about cooking on an open flame that is at the nature of who we are as a species. This building of cultures, that open flame is something that they've been doing in the Middle East for tens of thousands of years, you know, since, since we got there. I think what inspired me to do whole animal roasts was when I started working at Bel Campo Meat Company and we had access to the most incredibly beautiful animals, from lamb to pig to goat to chickens. And when one sees such a beast race so well, it's a shame to not showcase it at its, at its peak and at its beauty. And I think what people are intimidated by is they just don't know how to eat it or utilize it. So I thought, it would be such a great idea to actually invite people to an event and see exactly what it is that nature gives us and to not be afraid and to encourage them to come around a fire because naturally fire does bring people together. We cook with fire, we eat through fire. It's, it's life, it's, it's energy, so you know it's the core of everything. Every Latino community in Los Angeles has its secret places. And they're not secret because they want to have underground dining places, you know. It's not even about that. It's really about foods that they miss and culture that they miss. Chicharrones are something that I don't really, uh, I don't expect to find artisanal chicharrones here in Los Angeles. But this guy, Enrique, I mean, he is a master. La, la primera vez que yo llegué en la Olimpia a vender chicharrón, los hice en la casa y no se vendieron. La gente, nuestra gente está acostumbrada a comer fresco. No le gusta que lo hagas ayer, no, ni anoche. Le gusta que lo hagas hoy, ahí, al momento. Entonces, Eh, me acompañó mi hijo y dice, este no es negocio, papá. No vendiste nada. A los ocho días compro mi equipo, mi casito, y me pongo a hacerlo en la Olympic fresquecito ahí. Se vendió. Y desde ahí ya no he cambiado otro negocio porque, pues hay varios dichos, ¿verdad? Hay un mexicano que mientras la vaca de leche, aunque patee. <risa> Los Angeles is the most important street food city in the United States, and it's the only one that's illegal. But a lot of people are just out there, weekend warriors, and they're just trying, either they've lost their job, or they're trying to supplement their income, just feeding their families. Their stuff is getting confiscated. One time I did see the police basically line up on both sides and just like came moving in. They had a trash compactor driving uh, down the street, blocking traffic, and they were just grabbing people's equipment and throwing it in the trash compactor. It's insensitive, it's, 
It doesn't make sense because at the same time, politicians have been talking about trying to legalize vending. How can we try to legalize vending at the same time that we are completely just like creating a police state over street vendors, you know? Hasta te dice, te dan a escoger. ¿Quieres que te quitemos todas las cosas? Te las doy. No hay ticket. O te dejo tus cosas, pero te doy el ticket. Que ahí le pone cargos el oficial, el policía, y puede de 300 a 1200 es el ticket. Por eso corre la gente, por eso tiene miedo. Porque pobre gente vende en la calle, gana 70 dólares, 80 al sábado, 70, 80 el domingo. ¿Y cuándo vas a costar tú para 1200 un ticket? No vas a comer, no vas a pagar renta, no nada. Es difícil. Our economy has always been an immigration economy. This isn't like people trying to take our jobs. This is globalization. It's supposed to work like that. It's designed to work like that. The people that are coming here, they're going to become the new leaders of cuisine, not just in LA, but across the US. The difference between me and George, I was living in the States at the time, and my brother was living in Guatemala. They have a very big gang problem over there. So he'll tell me, oh, this, I got beat up, or they try to beat me up, or they try to rob me. You would have, like, gang members right outside of the school, and the inside of the school want you to jump in or want to beat you up outside. So it was either being with them or being against them. I, it's just, it's sad, you know, hearing about my brother struggling, and I'm here living comfortable and while he's over there trying to just survive. Now he's a father to two young boys, and you know, he's had his struggles and he's had his issues over the years. I can't imagine this place without him. He's as valuable to his restaurant as any of the other chefs, and he has a sense of ownership and pride about what he does. Alvin Kailan always had an ambition to want to then open up a, a ramen spot. Uh, that's how we ended up in Chinatown initially, was when he opened up Ramen Champ, I think about maybe two years ago. And then since then, he has Unit 120, he has Amboy, which is a, a Filipino barbecue stand that's operated also in Furries Plaza. I think he's very much part of this wave of younger 20, 30-something, um, second-generation Asian-American entrepreneurs who uh, see Chinatown as a real opportunity to be able to test out um, new concepts and new ideas. Unit 120 is a, is a kitchen incubator. It's for people to try their ideas out and pass or fail. So, I mean, that, that's how it all started, was just like really being able to be a platform for people to jump off. And like, there's people who failed. It's better that they just wasted $1,000 than building a $500,000 restaurant and realizing, oh shit, I'm not, I don't have the gusto for this. He came up to us and was like, yeah, I've been trying to come to Lhasa for a minute. Um, back when we were doing monthly dinners, we'd sell out all the time because it was just once a month, 120 people a night. He came to a dinner finally and loved it and then offered us to be his first residence here at Unit 120. And I ate their food and I was, I, I, it was really taken back. I was like, wow, these guys are the truth. Like they know what they're doing. And I kind of felt like how, how I felt like when I first started Egg Slut. And I was just like, oh man, these guys have something special. They were our first incubation project here at Unit 120, and they're doing well. I mean, like, packed house every weekend, and now they're in talks to open a restaurant. And that's like the dream. That was what we set out to do six months ago. Elvin has given us opportunity 
It's uh, his way of investing in us, um, giving us this chance, and just a bigger stage, you know? Three days a week instead of one day a month. Um, it's a lot, you know, we were able to do this full time until we opened a restaurant, and it's working, it's working. I think what we're creating is essentially Filipino Californian food. You know, we're, we're finding the bounty that we have here and integrating it into the, the food and the flavor profiles of our memories uh, growing up eating Filipino food. It was this nice, sweet place that we're trying to go with Lhasa, where we're making American produce taste Filipino. Isa is probably the best pastry chef in LA. I had her dessert at, at Orsa and Winston, and it blew my mind. And I was like, she's Filipino? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, weird. Like, we've come up, <laughs> you know? My parents, they really wanted to fit into society, which is very common for immigrant families. So I actually don't speak the language. Um, I was told speak English. But if anything, I always had the food and I always grew up eating that. And that was always the, the main connection to my culture. So when she left Joseph Centeno, she was here and I was just trying to bring her creativity out. I was just like, I mean, Dominique Ansel has the, the cronut. I was like, what are you gonna do? I was like, this is your time. You're, you're not working for a chef. You're in between jobs. What's your, what, what can you pull off? You know, like, what can you do? When I went to the Philippines, I wasn't sure if I was going to be inspired to do any kinds of desserts. And then when I got back into the country, got over my jet lag, I was like, I need to do some work. We had an event here at Unit 120, which was the Chinatown After Dark. And then somebody's just like, well, why don't you make something kind of like Filipino? And I really, I had never made anything specifically Filipino inspired before. So I created malas, which is a hybrid Filipino donut crossed between a malasada, which is a Hawaiian donut, and carioca, which is a Filipino fritter. And it's coated in latik, which is caramelized coconut milk. Like when you eat it, it's like, all the Filipino desserts put in one thing. And I was like, dude, if this doesn't sell, then I'm a fool. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so she sets up shop and she starts selling it and she start, her numbers were just as high as my numbers at, out of my lunch window. And I was like, this is what you should be doing. My grandma was the, she's the one who always will make like really good food and uh, that's my inspiration. Chef Michael was like, make the best, like bum ass sauce you ever made, so. Yes. Chiro Morning, what's your Morning? It's a Mayan word. It means uh, running nose. I uh, started like charring all these tomatoes, onions, cilantro, meat. My grandma, she never left no recipe, so I tried to like find a taste and try to remember her. She might go try it, and she's like, "This is really awesome. This is good." It's this great salsa that the more you taste it, the more you love it. And eventually, I asked George to make a more refined version to use on our menu because it's just so delicious, and there's so many things you can do with it. So we're, we're gonna cook them for 15 seconds. I was discussing with George, like, if you were gonna serve the chermol at home, and by at home I mean Guatemala, with a protein, what would you serve it with? And he said, um, if it was gonna be fish or shellfish, it would definitely be shrimp. So that's why we went with shrimp. To give it more of a local flavor, we're using spot prawns from Santa Barbara. And I think we're super fortunate to be here in Southern California, be able to access them throughout the season. So it was, it was basically, it was the first course that guests would get here. It was the backbone of the dish. And so George was very proud when, when it made it to the menu. 
Yeah, it was it was great. My mom used to work in the office when we were in Korea, and we came here. And it's not like she could get a job right away because we're not used to living the, the American life yet. So she decided to make a lunchbox, and then she would just go out on the road, go door to door, try to sell it. There's days she sells, there's days she can't. And there's days that, like, because her driving skill wasn't that good, sometimes she would go over a pothole, and next thing you know, the whole lunchbox would fall. And I remember my mom would park the car, and she would just cry sitting on the curb. Wow, Miss Kim. 예쁜 아줌마가 반찬을 해 왔는데 맛있을 것 같아. <웃음> 이러는 거야. 토요일은 우리 애가 놀잖아요. 그러니까 엄마 나도 가서 엄마 도와줄게. 이러는 거야. 그래서 그래 같이 나가자. 그 장사하고 고생하는 걸 얘가 많이 안. 그래갖고 그때 생각하면 참. <laughs> My mom opened this restaurant 22 years ago, back in 94. When she signed the lease contract, it said if we were to get bought out, get demolished, you, we were to leave. Regardless what the remainders of um, our lease is. But back then, the management company, they said, oh, it's okay, it's not gonna happen anytime soon. So we should sign, we're running it, and time came. It got bought out to these investors that, that wants to demolish this place and we're, we're literally getting pushed out without any benefit. We just have to start all over again only thing that we have is um, the loyal customers that we built that are willing to follow wherever we go. It, it just kind of feels like I'm going out on a war without any gun and bullet. Longanisa is the national sausage of the Philippines. And the one I'm making is from my province, Pampanga. Longanisa is all about the seasoning. How long do you cure it for to achieve this, this texture? And how the, the spices mature into it? These are like the minute details of the cuisine that some people just brush off. The Longanisa takes about three days for it to be ready. Filipino food, it's, it's very savory because you have fermented salt, you have sea salt, you have salt that comes from a soy. It's very regional. Certain parts cook with a lot of coconut, while other parts it's more fresh and more seafood driven. And other parts where it's more a focus on like pork and lechon, which is like a roasted uh, pig, you know, and stuffed with lemongrass and all this aromatic. Also, just the blending of those kinds of savory tastes, in addition to acidity, which comes in different kinds of vinegars. It's a salty, garlicky, oniony. And honestly, when you look at all the recipes, Filipino food is actually really quite simple. But developing the flavors is complex. Filipino food is generous, loving, and hospitable. I don't know if you can actually correlate that to, to taste, but the food has those three components. No matter how you mix it up, it has to have those three things. If you're gonna break it down to the very pantry of a kitchen, it's a very simple kitchen. So with simplicity, you have to evoke those emotions.
this is the time at which there's going to be a whole wave of these second generation restaurateurs um, who are now coming into food in ways that probably their parents didn't want them to do. I mean, they kind of busted their asses seven days a week in these uh, you know, cheap Chinese takeout spots or sushi joints or whatever in order so their kids didn't have to stay in, in, in the food industry. But their kids now, you know, armed with advanced degrees or culinary degrees, for them, they're really seeing the potential in food as a kind of a creative outlet, um, as well as something that might be financially lucrative. My grandpa's birthday was always a big deal and his favorite thing to have on his birthday was mole poblano. Así era, era su plato favorito. Y su siempre tenía a mí una olla de frijoles y una cazuela de sopa de fideo. Y para él era un un manjar. Usaba el, el pasilla, que es el pasilla negro, el guajillo y el poblano, el chile ancho. El chocolate, canela, pasas, cacahuate, pan, tortilla, semilla de calabaza, ajonjolí, chipotle, plátano. Mi mole era una cazuela así para toda la familia con su lata de chiles jarapeños, sus rebanadas de cebolla, sus rábanos, y la lechuga le encantaba en el mole. Hasta hoy día. Para mí ha sido muy fuerte su partida de él porque él para nosotros fue todo, todo, se puede decir. Él para mí fue buen padre, fue buen hijo y buen esposo. Él nos daba a su modo de él todo. Él era una persona que que decía, por esto trabajamos. En este mundo, Toña, venimos a cumplir una misión, a trabajar, a disfrutar lo que trabajamos, a comer bien. I would describe Middle Eastern cuisine as soul food. Middle Eastern food takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience. Anywhere from making a choresht, which is a stew, to making something like uh, matbucha, which is a Moroccan spicy tomato dip, it all takes time. Nothing's wasted for Middle Eastern cuisine. If you're going to cook a whole goat, you're eating all aspects of that. You cook it from head to tail. And you're making whatever you can with anything that's left over. To me, that is what I love about Middle Eastern cuisine. That open flame, beautiful spices, beautiful flavors, but also a knowledge that you shouldn't be wasting something that's essential for survival. And that's the key to Middle Eastern cooking and where it came from. people to take away when they come to our dinners at Lorme is an experience. You know, when you come to Lorme, it's not only about the animal that we're roasting. It's about the whole experience. 
Whenever people come to these events, they feel that. And we tell them and we encourage them to eat with their hands. And they're kind of like, oh wait, this is kind of odd. Okay, I'm gonna eat with my hands. But we kind of tell them, you have to do it, to feel it. En México no progresa. Con 8 dólares diarios no progresa en México, es el sueldo. Y aquí, aquí yo llegué a ganar, ¿qué? 500, 600 dólares a la semana de obrero. Tenemos lo necesario para vivir aquí, estamos a gusto en este país. Mi esposa, mis hijas, mi hijo, todo está bien. O sea, no anhelo a ser millonario, ¿ah? ¿Por qué no? Pero teniendo todo lo necesario y estar, lo principal para mí es la familia. Mi familia, mi esposa, mis hijos, mis nietos, tengo siete y una en México. Entonces, no le puedes pedir más a la vida y me gusta, me gusta el sistema, me gusta el sistema americano. I think the future of food is going to get better. There's going to be a lot more younger generation of cooks and people excited about the industry, working industry, to do their own thing and really go after it. You know, that's the exciting part. Los Angeles is in this kind of wild, wild west, pioneer stage of that wave of ideas and entrepreneurship. Everybody wants to have their own little restaurant. Whatever I say goes, and I've never been happier, to be honest with you. I've never been happier. Like, to be able to cook and connect with your memory, with, to evoke emotion in your cooking in the most simplest way, it's so much more worth it. So that's what Rice Bar is. It's not just like a matter of, of like the, the first generation of Filipino food, where it's like, well, I'm gonna open a Filipino restaurant because I need to survive. We're opening a Filipino restaurant because we want people to understand Filipino food, you know? It's an awesome time to be doing Filipino food right now. It really is. I think a lot of chefs are experimenting with Middle Eastern food. For me, it's what I've learned in my grandmother's kitchen, and I combine that with my Italian skilled background, working with Gino Angelini, and then working with Nancy Silverton. Combining those two, in addition to my creativity, is, is how I think that I can bring something new to Los Angeles in the Middle Eastern culture. So let's say I took all the bad stuff from one of my life, bring it here and just switch them, just like flip them, make something positive with it. And that's how I believe I have a good fire control of the restaurant. Just like putting your heart and putting everything you have and like do your job. And I'm still working on it. He survived a lot to get to this point in life, you know? He has a family. He basically runs the kitchen at Providence. So that's why I really admire him and look up to him a lot. And I kind of want to be him, you know? <laughs> he just pushes every day, pushes himself, pushes the people around him so that he meets like his own very high standard for what he does. And, and that's, I don't know, you, can't, you really can't ask for more than that. It's a story of long odds, it's a story of violence, it's a story of getting kicked out of a place that you know and love. They wound up in Los Angeles. They wound up in a town that's booming for some and it's hard grinding work for a lot of others. And remember, if you don't serve it to your mama, don't serve it here. It's a story of people dreaming of a better place. And that's why we're here. I think that makes the food taste even better. <laughs> because ultimately, it makes the food the story of survival.
뭐 그냥 가슴을 많이 아팠지만 은 예, 좋은 이미지를 남기고 가는 게 우리가 좋을 것 같다, 우리 아들한테. 아, 